Um, this is going to be an interactive session. Uh, we are going to be doing a tabletop exercise. Uh, so if you guys would like, you guys can move forward. I know you're going to balk at me. I'm at this table, whatever. Um, you guys are very much welcome to come forward. It's going to mean we're going to be able to get to you quicker. We're going to be able to talk quicker. I'll hear you better. Uh, but if you don't want to move all the way up here, we've got a couple microphones. People are going to walk around. I'll walk around as well. So the topic for today is conducting a tabletop exercise to get your team bell ready. I am Josh. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of LastCon here, myself and James Wicket. Uh, it, it's pretty cool. I, I think I'm one of about half a dozen people or so uh, that have been to all nine LastCon conferences, uh, which is pretty cool, kind of expected since I'm one of the co-founders. Um, I've been on the OWASP board of directors. I'm a former chapter lead for the OWASP chapter as well. Um, I am the security manager over at National Instruments. So I run the entire security program. I've got a small team. We do all the security things for NI. Uh, and then I also have my own uh, business on the side called Simple Risk, where we do uh, free open source risk management software. So that's me. Um, quick introduction here. Um, so how did we get started with this tabletop thing? Uh, basically, I go to these monthly uh, CISO roundtables, and they're great things. Um, everybody sits around, we talk about problems, we talk about solutions, they're awesome. Um, and so one of these particular uh, table uh, CISO roundtable topics was on instant response. And one of the guys who actually runs a, a bank out of San Antonio, runs security for the bank, uh, he mentioned this idea of tabletop exercises. And I kind of scratched my head. I was like, what's that? Um, and, and everybody else was really interested in what he had to say about this. Um, and he basically said, it's a way to test your instant response process. So you, you're basically taking your IR plan, and you have a scenario, and you run through the scenario, uh, and you use this kind of gamification to test out what's going to happen. And it sounded like a lot of fun. I like games. That's pretty cool. Uh, so um, I wanted to see what, what this was all about. right? And so my first tabletop exercise, I did a little bit of research. I tried to figure out what all was out there. Um, and I found this thing that was created by Sean Mason back in 2015. Um, and this, uh, these slides will be available. You guys are welcome to, to download it and use it. Um, and the tabletop exercise that we're going to do today is based on what Sean put together. Um, what he did was based on a FEMA national level exercise from 2012. Um, so FEMA had put this together and they stitched a bunch of stuff from uh, Brian Krebs's blog um, into there uh, as well. So um, you'll see bits and pieces of all that stuff in there. The FEMA thing is kind of cool. They had like videos and stuff, um, but it's hard to do in a, a format like this. Um, but you'll see the, the format here is very much uh, what I did for my very first tabletop exercise at NI. And we've done three of these so far. Um, we've picked a couple different topics, or, or three different topics for each of them. Um, and it, it was awesome. Uh, they've gone really, really well. So why would we do a tabletop exercise? Um, so uh, for those who aren't familiar with the term tabletop exercise, it's basically a small but inclusive exercise. It occurs as part of a cybersecurity organization's attempt to be better prepared uh, for potential related security incidents, right? It serves as a means to exercise preparedness, to validate plans, to test operational capabilities, maintain leadership effectiveness, examine the ways we work with larger community outside of our company to prevent, protect from, respond to, recover from, and mitigate cyber related uh, incidents. So we're really focused on how do we do this? How do we make this a part of our cyber cybersecurity portfolio? Um, and we're kind of testing what happens. Uh, the other cool thing about this is that we recognize that cyber incidents aren't just an IT problem. So we have lots of companies that are under attack. We've got hacktivists, we've got organized crime, all this other stuff. And we want to uh, include all the different components of a response for things like that. So we're looking at uh, how, do we, how do we bring in law enforcement in the picture, and PR, and marketing, and executives, and you know, everybody kind of has a role to play uh, as part of these uh, cybersecurity incidents. And so um, we, we bring those people in as part of the, the scenario. Um, this particular uh, scenario uh, focuses on our ability to coordinate and implement prevention, preparedness, response, and recovery plans um, for a, a cyber event. So that's kind of that. Uh, goals. Uh, so our goals are to examine information sharing among internal teams and external parties. Uh, a lot of our tabletop exercises, we talked about who we should be talking with and why we would talk to them and things like that. It, it's very hypothetical, right, because it's kind of a game, um, but it's pretty cool. 
We want to evaluate coordination amongst the affected parties. We want to assess decision making um, during a significant cyber incident. And we want to understand roles and responsibilities if there's a problem. And you'll, you'll kind of see as we go through this, we'll flush out different uh, ideas, different things that we could focus on depending on the situation. Um, and then if you were to do this as part of an actual tabletop exercise within your organization, uh, maybe you schedule meetings with everybody at the end, you kind of interview them, you want to get their perspective on what happened, you know, are there things for, that we should be improving, things that we can change, stuff like that. Uh, but so far, all the feedback that I've gotten from the people who have participated in these ha has been extremely positive. Um, this this uh, uh, was an email that came from one of the guys who participated in the very first activity. Um, and I won't read it to you, but it, it basically, it, he said, this is like Dungeons and Dragons, right? And Josh is the dungeon master, which is kind of cool when you think about it. Like, the whole goal is to gamify security, and here he is like, hey, this feels like a board game. So like any game, uh, we've got some rules. Um, we want to make sure that the conversations are productive. Uh, and so the effectiveness of this exercise comes from everybody feeling like they're involved, everybody feeling energized. And so the rules that we have are designed to stimulate discussion that's creative as well as structured. Um, so keep in mind, there's no right or wrong answers. All ideas are welcome, uh, captured and acted on as appropriate. And this is the point where you make a joke, all ideas except for that guy over there, right? Um, maintain a no-fault, stress-free environment. It's very important that our discussion is driven by group decision, problem solving, um, and again, no right or wrong answers. Uh, we use the scenario to provide context and spark ideas. Um, the ideas are based on the information provided by the scenario, but don't use the scenario to limit your thinking. Um, don't limit discussion to official positions or policies, because some aspect of this is about what we should be changing. Are there things that we should change about how we react or who we react with or things like that. Um, don't be afraid to go beyond like a title or position. So if you're like, you know, peon number one and you're like, well, you know, I really think we should do this and, you know, we should talk to the CEO, like that's totally cool in a tabletop exercise. Um, and then the last thing is we want to look at community resource and resources and things like that um, to aid and enhance our brainstorming. Um, so we're about to start the exercise. Before we move into the actual exercise, are there any questions based on what I've explained so far? Everybody's good? I've got blinding lights in my eyes, but I don't see hands up. OK, so quick disclaimer. This is about a four to five hour thing that I, I, I've done with my teams. I've done three of these, and all of them took about half day to do it. We're trying to condense this into 45 minutes. So I don't know if we're going to get done. Uh, I don't know how far we'll get. Normally, each of these modules will take like 20 to 30 minutes and discuss through and we'll write shit on the board. Um, in this case, we're just throwing stuff out there. And we'll see what happens. Uh, I've never done this before, so uh, let, let's see what happens. OK, so we're getting into the first module. This focuses on introducing the cyber incident scenario. We talk about ways where we can increase preparedness for a cyber threat. So what's going to happen is you guys are going to receive some information that was leaked by, uh, by an online cyber reporter. Uh, which will explain the situation. It will provide some details that will be important to the discussion. Right? Um, we'll also receive information from a third party uh, with very specific experience in cyber attacks. So just to give a little bit of background, um, you guys are probably familiar with hacker and cyber criminal. Those are people who exploit software vulnerabilities, right? Um, people who crash the system. Cyber criminals can be one-off individuals, but it's often like a, a cyber group like who's affiliated with organized crime or think, things like that. Um, and then you guys know about zero days and stuff like that. Um, but normally with these types of activities, we have people in the room who aren't necessarily familiar with these terms, and so we need to make sure that we explain those kind of things. So here you go, breaking and exclusive, right? Uh, security researchers discover a treasure trove of credit card data. Uh, independent security researcher Eric Poulin has discovered what appears to be a treasure trove of new credit cards available on the underground black market, the same cybercrime market used in the Target and Home Depot attacks, uh, which has sold tens of millions of cards stolen from past breaches of those two companies as well as others. They've been releasing batches of cards titled American Greed. In addition, Eric says, quote, this has been happening over the course of a couple weeks, which makes me believe that whomever, who, whomever is breached is either unaware or has not taken steps to prevent this from continuing to happen. So there's our, our thing, um, our American greed. At this point in time, we don't know who the victim is. 
though the cards are sorted for sale by zip code and reach across the US. Based on the sheer volume of cards for sale, it doesn't appear to be a small or medium-sized business that was infiltrated. Additionally, he believes that there may be a new variant of backoff, a malware strain used in past breaches involving credit card data, which has been designed to siphon data from cards when they are swiped at infected points of sale systems running Microsoft Windows. Uh, this new variant appears to be exploiting a new zero debt. When asked for thoughts on how companies can protect themselves, uh, some dude says, executives need to understand that their company is a target if they do anything involving accepting a credit card, as that information is highly valuable in the underground market with technology constantly changing, newer and more sophisticated defenses, and response approaches are needed to combat this rising threat. It's not clear how many credit cards may have been stolen, but sources from multiple major credit card issuers said that they are aware of more than two million cards total spanning multiple issuers. Another source at an instant response firm said it appears when all is said and done, this one will put, uh, will put its mark up there with some of the largest breaches to date, like Target and Home Depot. So with that, you guys are now in, in it, right? You don't know that this is your company, but we know that somebody has been breached. And so at this point, we kind of talk about, uh, we, we've got this information, let's talk about initial thoughts. And so I'll throw something out there. Um, we've got a couple mics. The first question that I have for you guys is at this point, um, do we feel compelled to take any preventative measures? Right, this is your company. This is the news. What do you guys think? Are we taking any action based on this data? And Tiana's got the microphone, Kyle's got the microphone. What do you guys think? Your security practitioners, we got one back there behind you, Tiana. Do is to determine if uh, you can gather a list of known uh, affected users and compare it to your internal database to see if that is uh, a potential breach on your part. Yeah, great idea. So we take this the the list that we showed up there. Maybe we go on the dark web and try and download something or whatever, and we compare the users, right? See, maybe is there some overlap with our user base or something like that? Or in this case, I guess credit cards, right? We're trying to figure out if the cards overlap with maybe our customers or something like that. So that's a great idea. We're trying to look for ways to, to determine is this us or not. What else? Come on, you guys are security people. You do this every single day. So uh, I would imagine we would want to check IDS, IPS for that time frame, right? Yeah, absolutely. So let's look at our logs. Let's look at our, our tools and see you know, is there something weird? Now we should be checking our tools on a regular basis, right? We should have some sock that's like looking at logs every day, you know, every hour of every single day, but maybe that doesn't happen all the time. And so we should be looking for signs. Are there alerts? You know, in the case of the target breach, there were like, you know, things that were going off, fire eyes were going off and nobody paid attention to it, right? So we see this and maybe we should be checking those. Maybe we should be looking for alerts. What else? Yeah, more specifically, now we know a, a specific malware family or attack family or something, we can go look more specifically for that particular. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Market. So they said they think it's related to the back off variant, right? So we can take that information, we can say, okay, uh, is there an MD5 hash or a SHA hash that we can plug into our system? Do we see that signature anywhere in our environment? Maybe we have honeypots or something like that. Are honeypots triggering on anything like that? Anything else? Yeah, Laurel. Are you exfiltrating data? Yeah, so data exfil, right? If these are credit card dumps, and it sounds like there's you know, a lot of them, uh, do we see data going out the door? Or is there large volumes going to IPs in Russia or wherever? Absolutely. These are all things that we can be looking for. Now, it's interesting, in our last tabletop exercise, we got into this kind of hypothetical, uh, kind of around this area, which is, okay, we talk about all this stuff, right? But the reality is we see articles like this on almost a daily basis, right? So-and-so has been breached or uh, we see a new credit card dump or there's a new variant of malware. The reality is I don't know how many of us respond to articles like this anymore because it's so commonplace, right? So some food for thought there. Um, all right, uh, so let's move on. We've got a few good ones there. So once we talk about that, we move into what they call planning and policy. Um, and so, uh, at, at this point, we kind of step out of our role at uh, our company. In this case, they call us Acme Air Inc. And we think about uh, what would have happened if it had been our organization in this situation. So we ask questions like, 
how do we currently integrate cyber preparedness into our emergency planning efforts? And are there ways that this can be improved? Um, what policies and procedures do we have in place to ensure adequate cyber preparedness? So let's think about that for a second. And, and you can use your organization as an example. Let's say that this is the kind of attack that's happening and you think your organization is the target. You know, we talked about like IDS and IPS. What other things should we be looking at in our environment here um, in terms of preparedness? What are the things you can do to prepare for something like this? Incident response planning. Yeah, IR plan, absolutely. So if you guys don't have an incident response plan in your organization, if you haven't prepared one yet that says, this is how we respond to an incident, here's how we escalate, here's how we determine the severity, and the severity determines who all is going to get involved in this, when we ex uh, escalate to executives and things like that, you absolutely should have an incident response plan. Um, that is key. And when we do these tabletop exercises, it's a good time for us to whip out that incident response plan and start going through it. And we actually did this in our last one. We said, okay, well, what is our severity at this point? At this point, our severity is like zero, right? We don't have anything going on. This doesn't affect our company. It's just some dude, some blogger talking about stuff on the internet. So we don't have a severity today, right now. But things can change on a dime, right? And we have to be prepared to reevaluate and to see where we're at. Um, all right, uh, so some other questions. Are we doing audits, right? Are we looking for this kind of stuff? Are we looking for the data exfil? Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So now we move on. And now we find out that it's actually us under attack. So as we read the following reports, we find out that our company. Uh, in this case, Acme Air Inc. has been breached. And as we read, kind of pay attention to the effects on the company, on our customers, on our stakeholders. Think about all the steps that we'd be taking as we try and respond to and stop this attack, right? So uh, this guy has a, a new thing, breaking an exclusive, Acme Air investigating credit card breach by cyber criminals. Sources say that Miami, Florida based, or Austin, Texas based, Acme Air Inc has hired an outside investigative firm to look into a possible data breach, potentially involving millions of customer card data, uh, credit card and debit card records, and possibly other information as well. Sources indicate that the criminals may have breached systems in November, ahead of Thanksgiving, in anticipation of the busiest travel time frame of the year. Multiple sources from top credit card issuers have confirmed that the breach has impacted nearly all of our locations worldwide, and involves the theft of data stored on the magnetic stripe of cards used at the stores. Additionally, there are unconfirmed reports that our website has been hacked as well to siphon off additional card information and possibly personal information, including logins, from unsuspecting passengers. Initially, investigators thought the breach may have encompassed just two weeks in November, uh, but unconfirmed reports have pointed towards evidence that the breach may have begun sometime just before Halloween and into December. The breach has affected an unknown number of our customers, who utilize our airport kiosk during that time. The investigation is still ongoing in regards to the online portal. The incident seems to continually be getting worse than an investigator close to the breach. At first it appeared to be fairly isolated, but as we've continued to peel back the layers of the proverbial onion, it seems to be a rather extensive breach. Most US locations have been impacted, as well as overseas. We're currently trying to determine if the online portals were affected as well. Recently, it was reported that millions of cards have been put up for sale on an underground forum known for selling stolen cards. While it's not verified these two incidents are linked, sources at major card issuers are beginning to see a pattern linking the two. Looking to a previous incident in 2013, Target disclosed that thieves had broken into its central IT systems via third-party uh, heating, uh, ventilation, and air conditioning partner and used the access to install malicious software on their POS terminals allowing them to steal credit card track data on more than 40 million cards. Still unclear what happened here, but these breaches are becoming more commonplace with criminals leveraging the weakest points in networks to achieve their goals. Like previous breaches of this magnitude, there may be an impact in the hundreds of millions of dollars coupled with high-level resignations. At this point in time, our company has not responded to multiple requests for comment. So now we discuss, right? We've just learned that our company was the victim of a major data breach. The attackers have been able to infiltrate our entire company. They've siphoned off millions of cards. 
Uh, they pos possibly compromised our website as well. And at this point, the most important questions that we need to address is really how would we detect the malicious activity on our systems and how would we respond to a suspected cyber attack? So let's talk. What do you guys think? How are we going to find these attackers? They are in our environment, yeah. right? We've been compromised. How do we find them? How do we get them off? How do we, how do we move on from this? So step one, I would like to throw out the idea that we don't know for sure that that actually happened. We have seen a report. Let's start by saying, announce social media that we're taking a look at the issue, make sure that the, our, our outlets or media focus is covered, but is we're looking. Then we turn around and we talk to our own red team or our incident responding team and have them take a look. Tell us what you see going on. What do you see? What are the logs showing us? Now let's start implementing our either our continuity plan, mm -hmm. pointing to where can we move to our alternate site that may not be impacted, or let's just start with looking at what we have, but take a defensive posture without getting too far out around until we can confirm not only if it's true, but the level of severity. Yeah. And then be as honest as possible without exposing too much risk to the membership. Yeah, and it, you said a few things there that, that I wanted to drill in on. Um, one is, at this point in time, we haven't made any statements to the media, right? But we got bloggers posting stuff. There's a lot of buzz that happens really quickly after Target got breached. All of us security practitioners, practitioners were on Twitter going, Target breach, Target breach, right? We, we, we all want to point to those guys. So while this stuff is going on in our organization, we need damage control. And what that means is working with our internal groups, probably our PR department, our corporate communications department, we need a response, right? And our response needs to be for our employees. Our employees, I mean, their livelihood is this company, right? So they need to know that our company is taking this seriously. Our response needs to be to our stakeholders, to the investors and things like that. How do we assure them that we have things under control, right? And our response needs to be to the customers who have been breached. How do we tell them, like, hey, we're taking this very seriously. You know, we're, we're looking into this. We've, got, we've hired the best guys to look at this, right, or girls. Um, how, do we, how do we explain that, right? And then the other piece here is we got the actual investigation to conduct. And so one of the things that kind of happens with these tabletop exercises is how do we segment this out? And that what we've kind of figured out is in a situation like this, somebody has to be the point person. Somebody has to be the, the, the center of, okay, my team is working on this incident detection. They're gonna go and they're gonna run off and try and figure out where we're compromised. Okay, PR, you guys should be working on this uh, response. Here's the data that you need in order to do that. Oh, IT, hey, let's go look at the backups. Let's think about do we need to move to another off-site facility or something like that. Um, one thing that I will throw out there, though, is I don't know if we can move to an off-site because I don't know. Our backups may be compromised. This, ha this has been going for months, right? So do we revert our systems to a state like six months ago? I, I don't know. But these are all good, good questions to have. In terms of the security operations side, what do you guys think? What should we, we be looking at? I would imagine you mentioned logging, but what we're looking for is correlation, right? We've got multiple events going on. We need to be able to query on those events across all those platforms. So we need SIM or some type of uh, Elasticsearch logging layer, right? Yeah. And we need to start digging into that to understand what's going on there. Also, I would assume we would have some type of endpoint security going on, and we want to understand not only like the north-south, you talked about XFIL and things like that, north-south of data, but we got to understand is there anything going on from an east-west perspective? Yeah, well, so it's interesting you say that. One of the first things we did in the tabletop exercise is we wrote on the whiteboard, here's all of the tools we have, right? Here's everything we have in our arsenal. How can these be used to help us, right? And so it's like NetFlow, right? We have NetFlow data. How do we use NetFlow? Well, we can use it for the data exfil stuff. We can look for weird connections from strange IPs. Um, in, in the case of Elk, maybe we're able to do machine learning and say, hey, where where are weird IPs coming from, or where is there weird, you know, odd amounts of data going to, or things like that? Um, maybe we look at DLP, right? If we have a DLP solution, 
has it detected any credit card numbers or things like that going out? You know, let's talk IPS. Are, are we seeing weird IPS signatures or things like that? Um, endpoint solutions, you know, you got Cisco AMP or Cyber Reason or whatever. Like, let's look at that. Are, are, is, is there things that we can see there, patterns that we can see there? Um, you know, using our SIM, doing the event correlation to see if there's all these different things that are going on. I think at this stage, tools are incredibly important. And the, the one kind of realization you have in these, uh, these situations is sometimes this points out where you're missing tools, right? It's, it's that blind spot right here where you're looking and you're like, shit, we don't have a tool to cover that. And so maybe that's where you write on the list. We actually did, uh, the last one of these that we did um, was a, a uh, crypto locker uh, worm that was spreading through our environment. And it, it was like, I, I, I kind of planned it because we've uh, had some issues justifying next-gen antivirus, at least you know the, the broader scope. Um, and I was like, well, let's use this as an example, right? If we had that software on all these systems, well, we wouldn't have had this problem, but we don't, therefore, crypto locker spreading. Congratulations, right? So sometimes these tabletop exercises are a good way to kind of show the need for these tools. Show where your blind spots are. And if you can get participation from some of your executives, from your management, and they start seeing this, and they, they start scratching their heads going, wow, yeah, that is kind of a blind spot. Um, so yeah, we talk about hardware and software and things like that that we could use. Um, what about third parties? I, I think we had mentioned in here that we had hired a third party firm. What about that? Uh, so actually I was going to talk about like uh, involving, so I agree with the other gentlemen. So like we're actually in the best position to find out what happened in this case. Uh, looking at all the, the logs we have and uh, Finding the entry point, maybe finding how they moved laterally to get to where they wanted. Mm -hmm. Also, um, like you said, it's a good learning opportunity to find out, uh, looking at all the, all the tools you have and the logs that were produced out of this, what were we missing? So what visibility gaps were there? Uh, so uh, basically, a, a report has to be put together. An incident report has to be put together for this. Uh, and then that report has to be provided to the proper authorities, um, institutions that are better able to find out who these people were. So this report is going to include you know, indicators of compromise. Uh, uh, agencies like the FBI can, you know, can use those to find out who the culprits were and uh, what their motives were in this entire thing. Right. So l let's do this. Quick show of hands. At this point, given your company, the, the company that you work for, how many of you guys are comfortable keeping this internal at this point versus uh, hiring a third party firm to come in and help with the incident response? So raise your hand if you're keeping it internal at this point and you're doing the investigations yourselves. All right, I see oh, seven hands, something, eight hands, something like that. How many of you guys would farm this out at this point? You're going professionals, you're calling Mandiant or SecureWorks or something like that. Uh, five hands. All right, some of you guys aren't participating. <laughs> All right, so it's interesting, right? We, we now know what's going on. Um, another question for you guys. So at this point, we know that, uh, well, how many of us are involving our executive team at this point? I hope everybody's hand's going up, right? This, this is like the forced participation. Everybody should be raising their hand at this point. Okay, um, cool. How many of us at this point, you mentioned FBI. How many of us are involving some third party calling the FBI agents, calling the police, something like that? We've got credit card data that's stolen, right? This does, it's data that doesn't belong to us. How many of us are reaching out to somebody like the FBI for assistance at this point? Real quick, hey, hold on. We got a microphone for you. Backing up just a, just a little bit, um, when this first happened, and I mean, I didn't know whether we were confining this to more of an IT or a technical discussion, but in a tabletop, you want to get your PR involved to address how we're going to take it to the public, but you also want to talk to your legal counsel or some kind of legal representation to understand timelines, um, you know, what you're obligated to disclose, and what's the appropriate third party that you would want to get involved 
as far as FBI or some kind of legal or law enforcement agency who would get involved. And then you can talk about whether or not legally it's a good idea to get someone like Mandiant or a third party involved to offload any kind of uh, responsibility or uh, culpability or whatever that would be called. But before any of this would start to happen with your own internal team, there's a few different non-technical arms that need yeah. to be involved, including your CEO or board. What's your name? Charles. Charles. Good job, Charles. So I, I was wondering if somebody would actually bring this up. Um, when we did this activity, I, we actually neglected the legal team the first two goes around. And it was like probably about this point in the third activity, I was like, oh shit, we need to involve legal in this, right? Because for one, we have cyber insurance and cyber insurance is handled by our legal department. They're the ones who have the relationship with the insurance company. They have to make that call in terms of whether do we, we call them or not. And they're probably the ones who are footing the bill for that third party, right? Our legal team has to uh, make decisions about do we disclose, how do we disclose. They're probably helping the PR group in terms of what do we actually put out there. Um, and an important realization that we had once we finally did involve our, our legal person was, hey, maybe we shouldn't send all this stuff via email, right? Because email, is, there's a record there of what, what's going on. Maybe we should all get in a conference room and have a real discussion about this, right? Because then we can talk through things and you know, we don't have to worry about being on the record. If you do send things via email, make sure that you include the lawyer and you say it's client confidential, right? That's a trick. Um, okay, other thoughts on this? Yeah, Laurel. You might also want to think about um, whether or not you're going to have to send out breach notifications. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think at this point we're probably sending out a breach notification. I, I don't think we're getting around that. And but absolutely, I, I mean, this is something we should probably talk to our PR department about and be like, right. hey. Well, PR and legal. Yeah, and, 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 and legal. Management. Absolutely. So you have to involve all of those groups. And also, you should have a, a list in your incident response um, of people that need to be contacted if this happens or that happens. And if you determine that it's an internal problem, you also have to involve HR. Yeah. No, that, that's a, a good point, too. So part of your incident response plan should include a list of all the people that you contact in different situations. And hopefully, there's multiple, right? So my PR or my uh, incident response plan has my lawyers in it, right? And it's got a couple of them in case I can't get a hold of one. Um, my incident response plan has PR in it, our corporate communications people in it. It's got you know, multiple people on the security team to contact. So the incident response plan, it, it, it's the playbook for how do we handle these situations. Interesting side note, talking with our lawyers about this, if you don't follow your incident response plan when an incident like this happens, you start running into this gray area where insurance might not pay for it. You're not doing what you said you would do. Um, also interesting in terms of that third party that we talked about maybe, maybe not hiring, right? There, you have a responsibility to maintain a lot of this information about the event that's happened. So things like memory dumps, disk dumps, system images, all those kind of things. If you don't handle that properly, and you just shut down and format the computer because you think that's infected and you know, move on, you're destroying evidence, right? So we have to be thinking about these things. And most of these companies that are trained in breach response, they have processes around all this stuff. They have uh, ways that they would handle that so that they don't destroy that evidence. All right, so now that we've kind of talked through initial thoughts, we've talked about our questions, Let's talk about some things that the news didn't report. So now you're getting some additional insight. Uh, so what hasn't been covered is that there were also signs of our internal systems that something was amiss. It started two weeks ago when our security event console indicated the detection of suspicious network activities. Our administrator conducted his daily check on the system backup server and discovered a backup error message. Upon further investigation, though, he didn't find any additional errors, nor did he notice anything unusual. The administrator logged the error message according to our standard logging procedures. In addition to those internal issues, the breach is having significant negative impacts on our business. As a company, our productivity has dropped significantly as a result of the cyber threat rumors. Several of the customers who believe their cards are hacked are threatening legal action. Uh, wary of what they perceive as unsecure systems, customers and stakeholders alike are refraining from making any investments in our company. 
as we move to the discussion part of this, focus on ways that we notify stakeholders and share information to combat this attack. So, situation in our business has reached a crescendo. We've got significant negative impacts now on our employees, on our customers. And at this point, the most important questions that we have to address is who would we or should we notify? We talked a little bit about that internally and externally in this event. And how would we uh, quickly communicate with key stakeholders to minimize the impact here? So in terms of our decision process, what options are available? What are our plans? Who are we reaching out to, law enforcement? What do you guys think? So I think one of the things is if you involve law enforcement, it shows that you're taking you know, extreme caution, you're taking all the measures that you need to take. But also I know one of the things that most companies that have had that happen, in order to save their reputation, they'll offer you know, identity management for six months or a year. So in order to save your reputation for long term, it's showing your customers that they are the first priority and that they care. That way we can try to protect stocks, we can try to protect our, our yeah. clientele and go from there. Interesting side note, I think there's so many companies that are getting breached these days that you basically get six months identity protection or years of identity protection for life, right? Our, our data is getting popped uh, all the time. What else? So depending on the regulations that, you're, um, that you have to adhere to, it might um, tell you what notifications and how you have to notify people. Because like with HIPAA, I believe that you have to notify um, through the newspaper during a certain period of time, and then you also have to follow up with as many people as you can through um, a physical letter. So question for you guys, what information are we sharing, and with who? Tangential to that, but your customer service folks are going to be the point of contact for external parties. Yeah. So you need to, even if the message is we're not saying anything yet, you've got to be sure that your customer service has that message and is delivering the message that you want to convey. Yeah. Um, I can uh, either confirm nor deny those. Or, or, or have some speaking points if you are ready to say something. Yeah. But also in terms of communicating internally, when you uh, presuming a, a large organization, you put out a, a broad message to all of your employee base, you have to assume that that message is going to get out to the public as well. So you want to be cautious and probably have legal guidance on what you're going to say to your own employee base. Yeah. So the advice from our lawyer in, in these tabletop exercises is don't say anything. As, as little as you can say as an, as an individual, you shouldn't be talking about this at all especially with anybody outside the company, but even internally, we haven't talked about this yet, right? So as a security team, I probably shouldn't be talking about this with everybody. I shouldn't be you know, going over to R&D and, hey, did you hear about the breach, right? That's something that should come from corporate communications, come from our CEO. We should be able to handle that message as it goes out. Um, same thing with you know, customer service and things like that. I mean, it, we probably need to let them know at some point, like, Hey, if you get questions about this, you know, just say we're we've heard the rumors. We're actively investigating, and we'll, um, you know, more information will be available once we find out more, or something like that, right? But we, what we have to realize at this point is our customers are going to be asking questions, our investors are going to be asking questions, our employees are going to be asking questions. As security people, this isn't our job, right? Our job isn't to respond to those questions, and our lawyer would say, you know, I can't confirm or deny that. You know, talk to our lawyer, talk to our PR person or whatever, or we'll be issuing a statement shortly, things like that, right? So as security, one of the best things we can do in this situation is stay focused, right? Our job is to focus on the breach. Our job is to focus on what happened, are they still there, how do we get them out? That's our job in this situation. All right, so we've now moved into this, uh, this third module. Um, so this is fallout. Uh, this is the third and final module. And even though the attack has been stopped, so we finally fixed it, Walter did a really good job, he's come down on, um, we're still dealing with the fallout at this point. We've got losses in revenue, we've got layoffs, we've got decreased customer confidence. 
We've been at this for about eight weeks now. And it all started with an alert that was overlooked and then quickly escalated to our banking partners notifying us of massive amounts of fraudulent card activity and it didn't stop there. To add insult to injury, other hackers took the opportunity to threaten us with crippling the company's networks and exposing proprietary company data unless they received $50 million, or maybe in this case it's like 10 Bitcoin, I don't know. Uh, and finally brought our website down, crippling our ability to communicate with each other and our customers. So we're now seeing other people try and take advantage of our situation. Thankfully, through close collaboration with law enforcement and security <coughs> consultants, we were able to stop the attack, but not before it caused significant damage to our business in the form of layoffs, profit losses, and our CEO has resigned. How bad do we feel? In the attack's aftermath, we're revamping our policies and procedures to mitigate future attacks and losses. Think about what we should change in the future. How can we make adjustments to our plans and systems to avoid this type of devastating attack in the future. We're basically target at this point, right? Our systems have been compromised, the data's gone out, our investors are you know, uh, balking, we've got lawsuits, all this other stuff. Now we have to figure out how do we improve? How do we move on? So now that we know that all of our worst fears have been confirmed, our CEO resigned, our stocks plummeted, We've been forced to make layoffs. We've got all these serious implications as the result of our attack, and we've got the picture of how this attack was orchestrated. So with this clearer picture, what do we think? How do we clean up our image to internal and external audiences after a situation like this? How do we regain their trust? Well, to some extent, you ought to, um, you ought to have some kind of PR around um, what happened and what you're doing in the future to uh, avoid it and um, what you're doing to improve your uh, breach response so that um, your customers can trust you again. Yeah. So are we, we're admitting we had a problem, right? Well, I mean, at this point, it's obvious. Yeah. 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 I mean, the guy kept saying, not going to resign, not going to resign, and then he resigned. Yeah. I mean, you kind of knew it was going to happen. Yeah. So, so we're, uh, from this point, we need to figure out how do we make it better, right? So where are we going to invest? What are we going to do? Well, where are those holes? Where are our gaps? So. There are a couple of opportunities, I think, stemming from where we pick up at this point in the story. So it's not just a mea culpa unless, it, depending on the industry, if it, is it definitely a financial institution that we are? I think it's an airline. So, okay, so an airline. Okay, so did something fall out of the sky? Are there, no, I'm serious. If, if planes haven't fallen out of the sky and it's a matter of trust, we didn't have someone get dragged off the plane. We didn't have someone fall off of a baggage uh, handling cart. Nothing weird. We had the thing that's happened to everyone else. So how we approach this is definitely going to color how our company grows or recedes mm -hmm. in the coming months. Because, hey, guess what? Target's still there. Home Depot is still there. People will take it. Equifax is somehow still there. Uh, sorry, okay. So I, I think we'd have a harder time naming a company that is no longer there, right? I, right. I think Heartland, maybe? Well, and so things like that. Okay, where's, by the way, where's the POS company that got owned in the Target breach? What's the, what's the name of that company? Anybody? So while we are all very aware of the pain that it causes, Sometimes I think there's an opportunity missed in companies saying, we made a mistake, we're working on making it better, but we're staying here to serve you. And, and, and taking that approach saying, it's about understanding something went wrong and not getting into this kind of spiral. There will always be people waiting in the wings to bandwagon hop and, and, and tear you down. But that's one of those things, if you listen to Hacking Dave or 
Jason Street or any of the, the speakers who step up and talk about having to survive against bad PR. There are always these situations. So as a company, uh, Acme Air should lean in perhaps to the skid a little bit and say, yeah, this is bad. But we are working every day to make it better and make a considered, uh, excuse me, a uh, considerable effort to send out a bunch of messages perhaps over the next, whatever the market will bear, starting with social media and then publish a small series of articles demonstrating, hey, we are taking steps. We know this isn't unstoppable. We know we can't fix it and make it perfect, but we're working consistently to make this better. And by the way, we're still here to serve you. And let's even throw a sale out because we've got to regain your trust. We want to keep that brand momentum going. I think so there's a job for you in PR, by the way. <laughs> um, what, what, let, let's talk specifics. Like what, what, what technology should we be buying? What should we be doing? What policies should we change? What, like, our, our organization got breached, right? There are gaps there. We can do better. How do we do better? What do we need to change? I think you're probably asking to get into the weeds and I'm gonna stay yeah. a little bit high level. Sorry, maybe this will go into the weeds. But I think, I mean, I'm not an expert on rebranding, but I think from a company standpoint, you have to talk to marketing and PR to find out how you wanna brand or rebrand the company to save face with the customer base. Internally, though, I think this would be the point when you would want to engage with a third-party forensics team to really have a neutral set of eyes look at what happened and bring that, in, that discussion internally to educate your own security and whatever, whatever staff is supporting the environment that was compromised. At the same time, I think that you wait a week or so and you look at how you responded to it, and that is maybe an internal discussion to look over your notes and say, what did we do? What can we do better and improve with that? But as far as the systems and such, I think it really does take an in-depth look by someone with non-biased eyes to say, here's what you did right, here's where they got in, and here's where it's broken, you need to fix it. So you're, you're relying on the third party to come in and tell you what you did wrong and, and what, how you need to change that? I mean, I don't think that you should rely solely upon them, but I think having a neutral set of eyes will add to the value of your own evaluation of what you've done. Yeah, it's the additional part that the third party, you've already done the evaluation, you think you know where it is and make sure that they, they attest that, that what you found was what they believe is also the right to answer. Because yeah. you're coming in with your, with your viewpoint of I found these issues, we know these issues, are, we think these caused it. They may say, well, it's these two, but these also these other two that y'all weren't totally focused on is also the issue. They may come up with that, or they may say, yeah, you, these, the, all these indicators were that. Yeah. You never know. But yeah, an impartial side. Yeah. It, it's a little hard in a situation like this because we don't have an incident response plan to pick apart, right? We weren't following specific processes or procedures. Uh, we don't have specific technologies that were compromised or things like that. So it's hard for us to, to dig into the weeds and come up with specifics. Uh, so uh, I, I agree with uh, what he was saying about trying to figure out what went wrong this time, but that's, that's this time. That's not necessarily what's gonna go wrong next time or the time after that. Software is always changing. And I think one of the things that we would have to do is try to get into this mentality of our system is broken. It's always going to be broken. The only way we're going to be able to prevent this, and it's not even going to be 100% effective, is to always assume that it's broken and always try to figure out, okay, I think the system works, but let me see if I can figure out a way it doesn't work. Get my, get my developers and get my security team to start just going at the system and thinking, if I were trying to get into the system, what would I try to do? What would I try to exploit? Maybe implement a bug bounty system so you can add all of these people around the world who want to get $500, $1,000, dollars $10,000 for finding something that they then report to you that you can patch before that other person finds it, gets another 10 million credit cards and then starts exploiting that and you have another PR nightmare. Yeah. That, won't, that won't clear up all of the issues, but it's at least something to where you're in this constant state of playing attack and defense against yourself. Yeah, that, that, that brings up a really good point, which is, you know, if these guys got in, Maybe we're not doing our diligence in terms of testing our systems. You know, maybe, uh, maybe we should be doing more to ensure our endpoints are protected, or maybe we should be doing more to hire bug bounty or, or hire pen testers to test our site and validate that there aren't any major issues with those kind of things. Absolutely. David. 
So it's, it's all of that. It's how did they get in this time? How could they get in the next time? How could we prevent that? And then how could we detect that? How did they move laterally? How could we prevent that? How could we detect that? You mentioned that in this scenario, there was an alert that was reviewed and was marked, was chalked up as nothing to be concerned about. What can we change about that process? Was the, was the alert not informative enough? Was there more context that was missing from that alert? Did that alert really not pertain to this event? But we had an alert, why did we miss it? Yeah. And how can we not miss it the next time? I'm glad you brought that up. And, the, and the, it's very reminiscent of the target scenario, right? They, they had alerts from FireEye and what they found out afterwards was nobody was looking at. So at the very least, one of our takeaways from this is maybe we should be looking at our alerts. You know, maybe we should be designating somebody to be the SOC guy who looks at those things. Or you know, maybe there's an AI platform that we can leverage to you know, highlight which alerts are more important than others or you know, something like that. But the fact remains, in both the target situation and Acme Air, there was an alert. There was a sign that we, should have, we could have done something. In this case, somebody dismissed it. They saw the alert and they said, eh, it's no big deal, and they moved on, right? Um, one of the other things that I think is interesting here is it talks about the fact that the credit cards wasn't the only thing. You know, they were looking at other things like the website and whatnot. So the minute we start seeing this, maybe we should start thinking about, is this cover for some other type of attack? You know, is this the only thing that's going on or have they breached other systems? And we turn from the kind of investigatory, investigatory, like what's going on to, you know, maybe we have to detect and contain, you know, how do we get these guys out of our environment? How do we find them in our environment? Those kind of things. Josh, one more thing. Yeah. Um, I think you also have to look outside of the box towards solutions. Um, you have to talk to your users, you have to talk to your customers, um, you have to talk to your, your, all your stakeholders and find out what they think you can do to improve things. Um, just, allow, just putting out some kind of bounty for your employees if they discover something helps them help you improve your security. I mean, that's one thing you can do. You could also look at the way other companies have responded to breaches and seen what they did well and what they didn't do well, and you can incorporate those changes into your response. Yeah. No, that's, that's a great point. And I, that kind of feeds well into the sixth discussion, which is uh, in the tabletop exercise, we move out of the fictitious world and we start looking back at our company. And we start thinking about, you know, what are the things that we could improve in our environment to, to be perfect? better prepared for a cyber attack. What kind of training should we have? You know, are there things that we can tell employees in case they see something like this? Should we talk to that IT guy and have a training on, hey, when there's alerts, you know, like make a note of it or tell security or whatever. Um, what about security awareness training? Should we talk to our customer service people about how to handle breach calls and how to escalate things like that, right? Um, yeah. How do, we, how do we help our employees? How do we help them to better understand roles and responsibilities in the event of this? Because at this point with the tabletop exercise, we're all just kind of sitting in a room talking about it. How do we take this exercise and move it out of that room? How do we educate everybody else on what that response looks like and how we're going to respond, how we're going to do things like that? So that's kind of the conclusion, right? We've gone through the different stages. I think we actually did really well on time. We had a good discussion. Um, thank you all for your participation. Even those who just raised your hand, didn't speak on the mic, thank you. you. You guys are still part of this exercise. I really hope that you guys learned something. I hope that you take this away. You go to your environment and, and you do the same kind of thing um, to help you guys be more prepared. So thank you. Oh, real quick. Other, other tabletop exercises that we've done, we did a denial of service one, that was a blast. Uh, we did a crypto locker one, that was cool too. And uh, for enhancement, real quick, uh, randomly remove people who are on vacation or unreachable. Um, the other guy talked about pulling names out of a hat, right? And you're like, oh, sorry, Josh is on vacation this week, right? And then see how the team handles something like that. Um, we already talked about involving legal and PR and whatnot. Um, executives, my, uh, my CFO said, hey, why don't you invite me at the last hour next time? I'd love to hear it, you know, be a part of this thing. So things like that. So yeah, tabletop exercises are a ton of fun. 
You'll find out where you're lacking, it'll help you to improve, and it helps you just to be prepared in general. Thanks, guys.